It is the sculptor of life in our American Southwest, carving out landscapes of almost unearthly beauty, where the first Americans lived for centuries and drank deep from it. It brings life to places that otherwise would know only the sigh of desert winds. It is the Colorado River. Hi, I'm George Page. For millions of years, the Colorado has been artist in residence here in the canyon lands of Utah. All along its almost 1,500 mile journey from its snowy birth in the Rocky Mountains to its salty demise in the Sonoran Desert, it is a river of life. The famous water wars of the American West are all about this river, who gets to drink from it and who does not. Harnessed by dams and diverted by canals almost from its source, the Colorado and its tributaries now provide water to over half the human population of our American West. So much water is drawn off that today this great river disappears into the sand before it reaches its delta at the Sea of Cortez. And yet, the Colorado still supports a great diversity of wildlife along its course. Our film by Wolfgang Bayer looks at this natural wealth and whether or not we can keep it. The Rocky Mountains steal the snows from the cold winds that howl across the Continental Divide. This is the cradle of the Colorado. Here in its frozen state, the great river still remains pure, pristine, and undefiled. Winter in this realm severely tests the toughest of wild creatures. In bitter weather, the bighorn sheep descend from the icy heights to forage where they can on dry mountain grasses. Biting storms may briefly sweep a grassy meadow free of snow, but soon winter lays its heavy mantle on the land, and all must struggle to find food. The resourceful elk graze beneath the snow, along the margins of the mountain stream, which will become the Colorado River. Free-flowing and warm compared to the frozen land, the infant river is a winter oasis of life. Ever moving, the river never freezes and so provides food and refuge through the coldest months for those who might otherwise perish. In its long plunge to the Sea of Cortez, the Colorado will gather the waters of many rivers. The main stem, known as the Green River, flows south from the Wind River Range of Wyoming, while 300 miles away in the high Rockies of Colorado, a second major branch has its source. Here in the aptly named Never Summer Mountains, snow cover remains throughout the year, and each fresh storm contributes to the water reserves of the Colorado. Under a blanket of snow and ice, the great river is born. It's a mere trickle at first, but when gorged with meltwater, it will in time grow into a mighty torrent. Clear, cold, and sparkling, the river that will nourish the West surges to life.
Even here, near its source, diversions for human use sap the strength of the Colorado, but its vital powers remain. In the golden sun of a winter's dawn, the river pauses on its journey to lend life to a snowbound mountain valley. The trumpeter swan resides all year along the upper reaches of the river, and in its icy waters, the muskrat finds both sustenance and shelter. The American Dipper is another permanent resident, a bird wedded to the water by its peculiar way of life. Waterproofed against the cold and wet even in midwinter, it manages to pluck grubs and water bugs from the river. The Canada Goose also spends the winter months living on the river's bounty, fortified by a year-round supply of algae, roots, and grasses. A barrow's golden eye displays for a prospective mate, perhaps a response to the break in the weather. Though most ducks desert the mountains in this season, the golden eyes find the river's resources to their liking and settle in for the duration. Like the muskrat, the river otter has evolved a lifestyle that is totally dependent upon the river. <laughs> Apparently oblivious to the cold, the otters thrive in these frigid waters, warmed by their waterproof coats and sustained by a seemingly limitless larder of fish. In midwinter, the valley of the upper Colorado is a haven for the hunter and the hunted. Ever wary, hungry mule deer forsake the safety of the forest to forage by the river. To the deer, the river offers life, but to reap its rewards, they run the risk of death. A sound, a sudden footfall on the rocks, and the killer's edge, the element of surprise, is lost. Heavy snow dashes any hope of hot pursuit. But winter, in its heartless way, provides its own gift for the luckless and the famished. Even when hungry, the cougar is cautious. Keen nostrils test the carcass to confirm that it's fresh. Then, with canny deliberation, the cat covers the cache with grass, a strategy to protect its prize from competitors. The trials of winter take their toll of the aged and the unfit, but the hardy and the quick will survive to see the coming of the Rocky Mountain Spring.
With a watchful eye for trouble, a cow moose ventures from the river. And under her doting care, her calf discovers a new world to explore. Furry coyote pups survey a curious world into which they were born a mere five weeks before. Now following the river valley, the elk ascend to the mountain meadows where they will graze throughout the summer on pastures made newly green by the melting snows. This is the domain of the golden eagle, monarch of the skies, wild symbol of the high, windswept spaces where it searches for its prey. The bogs and marshes below these mountain peaks are natural storage banks that catch and hold the runoff from the winter snows. And through the days of summer, the water in these reservoirs will guard the land from drought. Along the quiet tributaries of the river, the handiwork of one of nature's most accomplished engineers is evident everywhere. Next to man, the beaver has done more to alter the face of the land than any other animal. By damming streams, the beaver builds ponds, which not only provide for its own kind, but offer a place for others, like the trumpeter swan, to live and rear their young. For the moose, the pond is a salad bowl, for here it finds its favorite foods, succulent aquatic plants growing in profusion. And to the sandhill crane, the marshes that border the pond make an ideal place to feed and raise a family. Concerned for the safety of its own nest nearby, the red-winged blackbird swoops to the attack. In pursuit of the beaver's pelt, fur trappers once prowled the length of the Colorado, severely depleting the species. Today, its numbers are slowly on the rise, and the mark of the busy architect of the West may again be seen on the land. Now swollen by the waters of its countless tributaries, the stream assumes the stature of a stately river, rolling relentlessly toward the sea. Every spring, the cutthroat trout pit their lives against the rapids.
Full of minerals, nutrients, and dissolved oxygen, these waters now teem with trout, driven on by the irrepressible urge to spawn in the streams where they were hatched. Soon, a new generation of cutthroat fry will swarm in the shallow, gravelly waters of the upper Colorado. The hatchlings will grow fast, fattened on a rich diet of drifting plankton, and by autumn, they will be ready to follow the Colorado downstream. The bald eagle is keenly aware of the river's natural resources. A pair of these once common birds stakes its claim to a prime trout fishing locale. They rear their gangly chick within easy reach of this pantry. From its lofty nest, the young eagle looks down on its wide green world while the river moves on toward its destination more than a thousand miles away. Winding south from the mountains, the two arms of the river cut a swath through the high Colorado Plateau. Here in the 1850s, homesteaders and empire builders pursuing dreams of a promised land first gazed upon the Colorado. The river they saw wound gently through broad open valleys, good land for agriculture, as legions of Mormon settlers would in time discover. Though the river's might is muted here, it is still a mecca for life. A natural flyway, the Colorado will guide birds like these avocets on their journey north. While the lands brushed by the river are garbed in green, beyond its banks sprawls another realm, dusty, dry, and golden. This is the high sagebrush country of eastern Utah, where standing water is scarce. Here, the sturdy sage dominates the landscape. Drought and heat place severe restrictions on the ability of wildlife to survive. The pronghorn benefits by browsing on moisture-rich vegetation, a drought defense which also works for the white-tailed jackrabbit. But water remains the staple of life for all living things that make their home on the parched Colorado Plateau. Herds of wild mustangs descended from domestic stock brought by the Spanish vie for control of the few water holes in this sun-scorched land. Skittish and suspicious of people, the mustangs maintain their freedom by staying on the move. Seven hundred miles south of its source, the Green River joins forces with the Upper Colorado. Fortified by the union of its two strong arms and bearing a cargo of silt swept down by seasonal floods, the Colorado moves on, now a force to be reckoned with.
The river's power grows with each mile, and armed with biting sand and silt, it carves a course through walls of solid rock. For 10 million years, while the plateau around it rose, the river has slowly worn away the land. For 200 torturous miles, from Utah in the north to Arizona in the south, it slices a swath through a maze of magnificent canyons, carrying with it the sediments and seeds which nourish life along the water's edge. In full flood, the Colorado used to carry more silt than any river on Earth. This went to build the broad sandbars, which once hosted dense thickets of cottonwoods, willows, and other trees. These groves were the haunt of the Harris Hawk, but as the river shrank and the groves began to disappear, its range contracted drastically. Yet, where lush woods remain, the solitary vireo still builds her nest, and the mule deer finds refuge. The riches of the river have long been a lure to people. High above the Colorado, the cliff dwellings of the Anasazi testify to hundreds of years of advanced civilization. In these caves, the early Indians stored the grain they grew in irrigated fields below. Nearby, the canyon walls preserve a vivid record of their lives. The game they hunted. The weapons they used. the gods they worshipped. In time, leached of nutrients by years of irrigation, the soils which supported the Anasazi gave out, and the Indians abandoned the canyons, leaving the river to roll on its way, alone in its solitude and splendor. This is a land of little rain, of burning sun, and bone-dry winds. And remarkable strategies are needed to survive here from one rainfall to the next. When infrequent storms do bring rain to the high plateau, a seemingly miraculous event occurs in the sun-baked rocks. Though years may pass before summer showers fill these freshwater pools, almost at once, in the wake of the storm, new life swarms in these waters. Suddenly, thousands of fairy shrimp hatch from eggs that have lain dormant for years. Within a week, they will reach adulthood, produce new eggs, and die. The tadpole shrimp follows a similar routine, living its life in a hurry. For the busy shrimp, there's barely enough time to feed and spawn before the desert sun once again bakes its world to a crisp. 
The fossils found in these rocks speak of longer cycles of wet and dry, recalling a time when subtropic seas washed across the land, which is now the Grand Canyon. Like the pools of summer, the seas are now long gone, and the life they knew has gone with them. But change is the only constant in this land, and everywhere the creative hands of water and weather are tirelessly at work. at home here, finding food wherever there's water, and wisely it builds its nest where few predators will follow. A swallowtail butterfly pauses on a sandbar to sip up salts and nutrients while the river otter hunts its supper in the bountiful Colorado waters. In its capacity to nourish, refresh, and restore, the Colorado is truly a river of life. And more than any structures man has made on the planet, the canyons the Colorado has carved are works of stunning grandeur. Ramparts, towers, and mystic temples hewn of golden stone. As the river glides southward, it descends through six distinct climate zones, each with its own community of creatures. Chuckwallas belong to the hottest zone, where they cower in the shade, while the collared lizard braves the scorching rocks, and the desert iguana prudently protects its sensitive toes. The pink rattler, found only in the canyons, is colored to match the sandstone rocks on which it prowls. The desert bighorn is another resident well suited to the rigors of life within this arid land. But when the bighorns drink, they are most vulnerable to danger. Like many predators, the cougar fails in most of its attempts to bring down prey. But while it may wait to eat, in this hot climate, it rarely passes up a chance to drink.
With each thousand feet the traveler climbs above the canyon floor, the air temperature falls by an average of four degrees. Until a mile above the river, on the edge of the Grand Canyon, the climate resembles that of the Wyoming Rockies. Here on the high north rim, a forest of cool ponderosa pines replaces the burning desert far below. This forest hosts the world's entire population of the elusive kaibab squirrel, which feeds exclusively on the twigs and cones of the ponderosa pine. With its silver white tail and red striped back, the kaibab squirrel is a standout. But a mere 10 miles away as the eagle flies lives a close relation. On the south rim of the canyon, the less ostentatious Abert squirrel follows a lifestyle very much like its kin. At least 20,000 years have passed since the two squirrels diverged, a testament to the power of the river as a shaper of life and land. One of the great natural wonders of the earth, the Grand Canyon has many moods and wears ever-changing faces. In 1540, fired by tales of riches, an expedition under Vasquez de Coronado reached the south rim of the canyon. In horror, the Spaniards withdrew, dismissing this land as an arid hell, useless to God or to man. Others came later seeking souls to save, but all fell back from the yawning abyss one of the most awesome obstacles men had ever confronted. It was left to John Wesley Powell, a Civil War major, to conquer the canyon in 1869. Against all odds, he hoped the river might prove a practical highway for commerce. That hope was dashed in his hair-raising ride through the rapids. But it was in the chasm that he found, in his words, a sublimity never again to be equaled this side of paradise. Wealth of a more worldly kind in time brought gold prospectors to the canyon. And the burrows they set free still roam the rim, hardy survivors long after the frontier era. Many animals and people claim a share of the Colorado's waters. One of the oldest claims belongs to the Navajo, heirs to the arid lands abandoned by the Anasazi. The San Juan River, a tributary of the Colorado, is vital to the Navajo herds.
Today, land which the Anasazi over-farmed is over-grazed by the Navajo. And survival here on the edge of the Colorado turns on the availability of that single precious commodity, water. To quench a far larger thirst, Hoover Dam was built below the Grand Canyon. Completed in the Depression year of 1935, the dam was a proud monument to a nation's triumph over the forces of nature. Behind the dam, Lake Mead, 110 miles long, captured the Colorado's waters for release according to an agreement among seven western states and Mexico. The wild river had been tamed and made a servant to human needs. In what was once a desert canyon, fish introduced to supply sport for anglers are now gorged upon by cormorants. The age-old balance of life along the Colorado has been precariously tipped. The Colorado squawfish, one of 13 species of fish native to the river, is no longer found below the dam, which blocked access to its spawning grounds upstream. Changes in stream flow and water temperature have also threatened another native species, the distinctive humpback chub. By drawing cold water from the bottom of the reservoir and releasing it on demand downstream, the dam has radically altered the river. Power generated by the water that spills through Hoover Dam feeds into a grid that keeps the lights burning and the air conditioners humming 24 hours a day in the year-round boom town of Las Vegas. But Nevada is not the dam's sole beneficiary. 14 million people in Phoenix, Tucson, and Los Angeles are dependent on the Colorado for power and water. No river in the world is more heavily used than the Colorado, with much of its wealth diverted for agriculture. But this use is costly, for salts dissolved from the fields and returned to the river slowly poison its waters. Much of the produce grown along the river is highly water consumptive, requiring intensive irrigation to yield a commercial crop. Yet, the lion's share of the water, a full 90%, is used to grow hay for livestock, draining the river to satisfy only 4% of the national market for beef. That hunger for water led to the construction of a second major dam, 350 miles upstream from the Hoover, just above Grand Canyon. The Glen Canyon Dam, completed in 1964, was to fuel a burst of prosperity in the west. But a scenic canyon nearly 200 miles in length was drowned behind the dam. With almost 2,000 miles of shoreline, the Mammoth Reservoir, christened Lake Powell, dwarfs most other artifacts made by man on Earth. The Great Lake is clearly visible from satellites in space. Now federal officials could boast that it was possible to control the flow of the Colorado like the water from a garden hose. A wilderness no more, the Grand Canyon now qualifies as a prime recreation area 
attracting three million visitors in an average year. Today, there's little that remains truly wild within the Grand Canyon. And with 15,000 tourists making the run downriver each year, serious concerns have surfaced about the effects of overuse. With floods a thing of the past and its flow reduced to a fifth of its former level, the river now runs to a different rhythm and life along the stream has changed with the times. Banks which once were scoured by seasonal floods have been colonized by the tamarisk, a fast spreading tree from the Middle East, introduced to the West a century ago to stabilize river banks. The spread of the tamarisk is watched with worry, for while woodlands now flourish where none existed, the trees may discourage native birds and animals which belong to the old streamside community. But few of these changes are apparent as yet to those who journey downriver, and in its physical features at least, the Grand Canyon remains a place of unsurpassed splendor. South of the canyons, the Colorado glides on. And though its flow is diminished by the dams and diversions upstream, it still has the power to replenish the land through which it passes. In Arizona, on the edge of the Sonoran Desert, a sprawling marsh steeps in the river's waters a refuge from the heat and dust, cool and green and brimming with life. Ironically, the vibrant life of the marsh owes its existence to the Parker Dam downstream, which flooded this desert valley. But up on the dry banks, only a few yards from the river, is a different world. Fuzzy forests of jumping choya thrive here on a ration of less than three inches of rain a year. And stands of giant saguaro give lie to the notion that the desert is barren and devoid of life. In this desert land, water is the elixir of life, as vital to the coyote and the hornet as it is to the white-winged dove and the gambles quail. Until recently, this arid wonderland was left untouched, a place deemed fit for a few crusty creatures 
but for little else. But change has come to the Sonoran Desert and to the river which cuts it in half. Cattle now overgraze the fragile land and guzzle at the water holes where desert creatures drank. But these changes pale compared to those which are in store. The Central Arizona Project, now nearing completion, has called for the construction of a colossal aqueduct to carry water from the Colorado River more than 200 miles across the desert to Phoenix and Tucson. While Arizona may benefit from the boom, across the Parker Dam there's widespread fear that soon, when Arizona begins drawing its full share of water, the tap will turn off on the cities and farms of Southern California. On Lake Havasu, meanwhile, the reservoir behind the dam a bustling community has sprung up overnight, complete with its own nod to another great river in the form of the original London Bridge, brought here stone by stone. At times more of a swimming hole than a river, the Colorado endures hordes of weekend visitors who come to wallow in its waters. The cost is high to the river's pride. Below Parker Dam, the river, now confined to a graded ditch, waters the crops which have made California's Imperial Valley the winter garden for the nation. Herbert Hoover once said, every drop of water that runs to the sea without serving a commercial use is a public waste. Today, every drop of the Colorado's water is used at least three times before it's returned polluted with salt and fertilizers to the river. At last, with most of its vigor spent, the great Colorado reaches Yuma, Arizona and the international fence of Mexico. Without fanfare or farewell, its sullied waters slip across the border. Then farther on, they spill into a soggy marsh, the last gasp of the dying river. Here, the endangered Yuma Clapper Rail still hides while wood storks probe in mud heavily laced with salt, the poison cargo contributed by the runoff of countless irrigated fields along the river's course. In this hottest quarter of the continent, species have evolved which take the harsh conditions in their stride. The desert pupfish is one of these, found only here at the end of the Colorado. 
Though renowned for its resistance to heat and salt, the tiny fish has been pushed to the brink by competition from introduced fish and by the draining of its last wild retreats. In 1922, naturalist Aldo Leopold described this region as a place of green lagoons, lovely groves, and awesome jungles, where the jaguar still prowled. But all of that is no more. Seventy-five miles south of the border, exhausted from all of its labors, the Colorado concludes its journey in the sand just short of its goal. The great wild river has been wrung dry. Beyond, the destination that the river never reaches. The Sea of Cortez. Though the once mighty Colorado River no longer reaches the sea, along its way it has worked wonders, supporting the development of the great Southwest and supplying recreation to millions. But as Aldo Leopold said, there are some who can live without wild things and some who cannot. Like winds and sunsets, wild things were taken for granted until progress began to do away with them. Now, said Leopold, we face the question of whether a still higher standard of living is worth its cost in things natural, wild, and free. Nature is made possible by the financial support of viewers like you. And by Siemens, engineering solutions in electronic components and medical systems. Telecommunications, energy and automation, Siemens. And by Canon, quality and innovation for the way we work and live. And by the gas industry, helping provide cleaner air with clean gas energy. Next week on Nature, we'll take you to the rainforest of Upper Guinea in West Africa, home to primates of 11 different species. Join us next Sunday at 7 for T.Y., Island of the Apes. Coming up next on 11, Michael Wood is your guide for the premiere of Legacy, a six-part series that will explore the rich heritage of great civilizations of the past 5,000 years. Stay tuned for Iraq, the cradle of civilization, and India, the empire of the spirit. Next, here on your window to the world.